Elizabeth Woodville and her second husband, King Edward IV, were incredibly fortunate when it came to the production of healthy heirs. Elizabeth would give her husband a total of ten children, three boys, the most famous being Edward and Richard, commonly known as the Princes in the Tower, and then seven girls, with the most well-known being Elizabeth of York, the wife of King Henry VII and the mother to King Henry VIII. However, three of these seven daughters, Princesses Cecily, Anne and Catherine, would lead lives just as fascinating and dramatic as their eldest sister, and like their cousin Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, would eventually discover life under the rule of the Tudors had its challenges. So who were these forgotten York princesses? What were their lives like? And why are they all but forgotten by history? Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast, episode 33, Cecily, Anne and Catherine, the Forgotten Princesses of York. As I referenced a moment ago, there were seven daughters born to Elizabeth Woodville and Edward IV. Elizabeth, the eldest, was born on the 11th of February 1466. In the summer of 1467, she was joined by her sister, Mary. However, Mary died at the age of 14 in 1482. And as I'm focusing on the lives of the York princesses who reached adulthood and had children of their own, I am not covering Mary's story today. 17 months after Mary's birth, another sister followed, Cecily, who was born on the 20th of March 1469. She was born at Westminster Palace and named for her paternal grandmother, Cecily, Dowager Duchess of York. The birth of Cecily, the third daughter in a row, was a great disappointment for Edward IV. With that said, he showed great love for his daughters and was far from the man that his grandson Henry VIII would become, for he suggested that if he did not have sons that the crown would pass to his eldest daughter, Elizabeth. In the first months of Cecily's life, an acute political crisis arose across the country. Edward IV's most powerful supporter, the Earl of Warwick, dissatisfied with the king for a number of reasons, entered into an alliance with Edward's troublesome younger brother, George, Duke of Clarence. They moved their troops from Calais to England and announced George's claim to the English throne. Soon, the Earl of Warwick captured the king and executed without trial Cecily's maternal grandfather and uncle, Earl Rivers and John Woodville. At the same time, Cecily's maternal grandmother, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, was arrested after being accused of witchcraft and the use of love spells on the king. Although Jaquetta was acquitted, this unpleasant episode, as well as the unmotivated execution of Earl Rivers, showed how far the enemies of King Edward IV were ready to go to destroy his wife and her family. A chilling reminder that although the king deeply loved his queen, many members of his court did not. By the autumn of 1469, Edward IV managed to regain his freedom, leaving Warwick and the Duke of Clarence to flee to France and form an alliance with none other than Margaret of Anjou, wife of the deposed Lancastrian king, Henry VI. In September 1470, as the king prepared for an invasion by the combined forces of his enemies, Cecily, her sisters and her mother were moved into the Tower of London for their safety. Already in early October, it became known that Edward IV, together with his brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, had fled the country, having only a small hope of returning. Upon receiving this news, Queen Elizabeth, along with her mother, her three sisters and her young daughters, hurriedly left the tower on a barge and arrived in search of refuge at Westminster Abbey. It was then almost empty, and as such the Queen was able to seek sanctuary. They were taken under the protection of the Abbot of Westminster, Thomas Myling, a kind, hospitable man who did not want to place the Queen and her children with the criminals who had also sought sanctuary there, and instead gave them his house at the western entrance to the Abbey. 
There were three rooms and everything necessary for the comfort of the royal family. Touchingly, it is also documented that ordinary Londoners provided assistance to the Queen and her young children. For example, a butcher, John Gould, donated half a cow and two sheep a week to the family, and a fishmonger provided them with provisions on Fridays and fasting days. This is unsurprising, for the Yorks had always been popular with the people of the capital. While in hiding, the princesses spent much of their time with their nannies. In early November 1470, their brother, Prince Edward, was born, and Queen Elizabeth was busy caring for him. Princess Cecily and her family would spend another five months in sanctuary. In 1471, Edward IV returned to England, and the first thing that he did after attending a Thanksgiving service at Westminster Abbey was to bring his family out of hiding. On that very same night, Cecily, along with her other family members, was transported to Baynard's Castle, which served as the residence of her grandmother, Cecily Neville. On the 11th of April, Princess Cecily, accompanied by her grandmother Cecily and the Queen's brother Anthony Woodville, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Bouchier, went to the royal chambers of the Tower of London, while Cecily's father went north to reclaim the crown. On the 13th of April, the Earl of Warwick was killed at the Battle of Barnet, and on the 4th of May, Edward IV finally defeated the Lancastrian troops at the Battle of Tewkesbury, in which the Lancaster heir, Edward of Westminster, was killed, and Margaret of Anjou was captured. However, on the 12th of May, while Edward IV was still on his way to London, the last supporters of the Lancastrian faction organised an attack on the tower, intending to restore Henry VI to the throne. Two towers, one of which Cecily and her family were sheltering in, were fired on from the river. The attack was repulsed, and on the 21st of May 1471, King Henry VI was pronounced dead, officially dying of sorrow, but more likely he was killed on the orders of the reinstated Edward IV. With her father back on the throne, and now in a strong position of power, Cecily returned to the position of the daughter of a legitimate and recognised monarch, and as a princess of England. Queen Elizabeth soon gave her husband another two children, with Margaret born in 1472, although sadly dying just seven months later, and Richard, Duke of York, the younger of the princes in the Tower, born in August 1473. 1474 would be a significant year for the now five-year-old Princess Cecily, for the first marriage plans for her began to appear. Her father, the King, negotiated the marriage of his daughter to the heir of the Scottish throne, James, Duke of Rothsey. The formal betrothal took place on the 26th of October 1474 in Edinburgh between the proxies of the bride and groom, the Earl of Crawford and Baron Scrope, respectively. Since the conclusion of the engagement, Cecily was thereafter referred to as the Princess of Scotland. Little is known about Cecily's life during the Scottish marriage negotiations. Until December 1475, the princess was probably brought up by a governess, Lady Margaret Berners, who was the wife of John Bouchier, a great-grandson of King Edward III and a close friend of the Woodville family. Evidence points to it being Margaret Berners who raised Cecily, as prior to this, she was engaged in the education of her elder sisters, the princesses Elizabeth and Mary. In 1476, Cecily, among others, attended the reburial ceremony for the remains of her paternal grandfather, the Duke of York, and his second son, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, at Fotheringay Castle. Two years later, she attended the wedding of her younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, and Anne de Mowbray, 8th Countess of Norfolk, and in 1480, she, along with her older sister Mary, were named Ladies of the Garter. A few years prior, in 1475, Cecily had another sibling come along, for on the 2nd of November of that year, Princess Anne of York was born. The little Princess Anne was baptised at Westminster Abbey shortly after birth, being named for both her paternal aunt, Anne of York, Duchess of Exeter, and her paternal great-grandmother, Anne Mortimer. Although we think of Anne as being distinctly royal, it was a relatively new name to the English royal family, with Princess Anne of York having the distinction of being the first Princess Anne in English history. The choice of Anne as a name may have also been at the suggestion of King Edward IV, for he held superstitious reverence towards Saint Anne, turning to the patronage of the saint at critical moments in his life in the early stages of coming to power, and therefore felt indebted to her. Towards the end of the summer of 1479, the final princess that I will be discussing today, Princess Catherine of York, was born. Unlike her elder sisters, we do not have a definite date of birth for Catherine, 
although historians generally agree that it would have been around the 14th of August and that she was born at Eltham Palace. In that same year, Catherine's elder sister Anne, who was not yet four years old, was nonetheless having a marriage alliance brokered by the king. Anne would be promised in marriage to Philip, son of the Archduke Maximilian of Austria. The Austrian prince at the time was second in line to the throne of the Holy Roman Emperor. The initiative of the union came from the Archduke and understandably was enthusiastically received in England since their marriage was supposed to bring major political benefits. Philip's mother, Mary of Burgundy, was the heiress of vast lands and had influence on European affairs. There were also strong familial ties, for Philip's step-grandmother was Edward IV's sister, Margaret of York. The following year, the agreement took on a more formal form. As a financial security for the princess, she was allocated an amount of 100,000 crowns, and Archduke Maximilian agreed to pay Anne 6,000 crowns per year from the moment that she reached the age of 12 years, the age of marriage consent, and from the moment that she arrived at the court of her future father-in-law. This is what enabled the king to ensure that the engagement was ratified. Anne was to receive lands in Artois, worth 8,000 livres of her use, and on the 5th of August 1480, negotiations were completed. In 1481, when Princess Cecily reached marriageable age, James III of Scotland began to insist on her marriage to his son. An embassy was sent to England, which was supposed to deliver the princess to Scotland, but Edward IV felt that the Scottish king was only motivated by the desire to obtain the remainder of Cecily's dowry, and the princess's departure was delayed. A year later, the engagement between Cecily's older sister Elizabeth and the Dauphin Charles of France was broken off, and James III decided to follow the example of his French patron. The formal reason was that James III's brother, Alexander, Duke of Albany, who was accused of treason, was hiding at the English court. Demanding the extradition of the rebellious duke, the Scots made several raids on the border territories in the north of England, which caused Edward IV in June of 1482 to break off his daughter's engagement and consider instead the betrothal of Cecily to the Duke of Albany, whom the English king intended to help put on the Scottish throne. On the 11th of June, the Treaty of Fotheringay between Albany and Edward IV was signed. Its terms included agreement to the marriage of Cecily and the Scottish pretender, and by 1482, Edward IV had helped the Duke of Albany to seize the regency. Alexander announced his claims to the throne, was forgiven by his brother, and received his possessions back. The Scots, as was customary, were unhappy with the presence of English troops in the country, and therefore put pressure on James III to resume the betrothal between his son and Princess Cecily. Edward IV agreed to resume negotiations on the condition that he would be returned that part of his daughter's dowry that had already been paid. However, the negotiations were never resumed, because the Duke of Albany again turned to the English king for help, and his marriage with Cecily was once again under consideration. Like her elder sister Cecily, Princess Anne's own marriage contract with Philip of Austria remained in force, but this would all change when King Edward IV died quite suddenly in April 1483. The death of Edward IV was followed by a political crisis that dramatically changed the position of the former Queen Elizabeth Woodville and her children. The princess's eldest brother, Edward, succeeded his father to the throne as King Edward V, but was of course captured by his uncle, the Lord Protector, Richard Duke of Gloucester, on his way from Wales to the capital. At the same time, Anthony Woodville and Richard Grey, the princess's maternal uncle and half-brother, who accompanied the young king, were arrested and shortly thereafter beheaded despite promises of safe conduct. Edward V was moved to the Tower of London to await his coronation, a coronation which would never come, where he was later joined by his only remaining brother, Richard, Duke of York. The rest of his family, so his sisters Cecily, Anne and Catherine, and the Queen Dowager took refuge once more in Westminster Abbey. On the 22nd of June 1483, the marriage of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville was declared illegal and all of the couple's children were declared illegitimate and deprived of their rights to the throne and all of the titles that they formerly held. At the same time, their cousins, the Earl of Warwick and Lady Margaret of Clarence, the children of the late George, Duke of Clarence, were also removed from the line of succession, the basis of this being their father's attainder for treason. On the 6th of July, Richard of Gloucester was proclaimed king under the name of Richard III. 
Shortly thereafter, the princess's brothers, who remained locked up in the Tower of London, would disappear. After Richard III took the throne, there were fears that one of the elder York sisters, Elizabeth or Cecily, would be able to escape abroad and find an ally there to overthrow Richard III. On Christmas Day 1483, Henry Tudor, whose mother, Margaret Beaufort, had been plotting with the Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville against Richard III, swore in Wren Cathedral that he would marry Elizabeth of York, or should there be some impediment to the marriage, that he would then take Cecily to be his bride. Sadly, the planned rebellion by the Tudor forces, led by the Duke of Buckingham, was put down before Henry Tudor had taken his oath. After the failure of Buckingham's rebellion, Richard III began negotiations with his brother's widow, and on the 1st of March 1484, Richard publicly swore that the daughters of Edward IV would not be harmed or molested, and that they were safe to come out of sanctuary. Furthermore, he promised that they would not be imprisoned in the Tower or any other prison, and that they would be placed in respectable places of good name and reputation, and later be married to men of noble birth and given dowry lands with an annual income of 200 marks each. On the same day, the memorandum was delivered to the Queen Dowager along with provisions. The princesses left the shelter and moved under the care of their gracious uncle, who allocated them chambers in his palace. Soon after the York princesses arrived back at the court, their uncle the king began to look for suitable suitors for his nieces. In Cecily, he decided to politically neutralise her, for Richard was aware that Cecily was second in line behind her elder sister Elizabeth in the eyes of Henry Tudor. And so if he married her off to someone far below her in status, then it would rule out her claim to the throne. The king's plans were carried out and Cecily was married off to Ralph Scrope, the younger brother of the sixth Baron Scrope of Masham, quite a downgrade from the heir presumptive to the Kingdom of Scotland. For Princess Anne, he chose Thomas Howard, the son and heir of the first Earl of Surrey and second in line to the Dukedom of Norfolk, to show his favour to the Howard family. This is the same young man who would grow to be the Duke of Norfolk, who was the uncle of Queens Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. In August 1485, Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth, and now having gained the throne as King Henry VII, the first Tudor king repealed the Titulus Regis Act, which deprived the children of Edward IV of titles and rights to the throne. Although Henry VII made it clear that his claim to the throne was entirely his, Few doubt that his marriage to Elizabeth of York is what actually guaranteed some measure of safety and helped to solidify Tudor rule. Although now married to Elizabeth of York, the most potent symbols for potential rebellion lay in the person of the Queen's closest affinity, her sisters and her cousins, particularly the children of the Duke of Clarence. Henry VII thus turned to the oldest trick in the book and began marrying off the remaining Yorkist princesses to trusted members of the Tudor affinity. The marriages that he would negotiate would be relatively suitable, but the grooms lowly enough to render the princesses less desirable claimants to the throne. The most overtly poor marriage was that of Margaret of Clarence, who was wed to Sir Richard Pole, a man grossly inferior in status to the daughter of a royal duke and niece of two of England's kings. The marriage of Princess Cecily to Ralph Scrope was annulled in 1486 as not being in the interests of the new Tudor dynasty, and as Cecily and her sister Anne were among the older of the princesses, it was also natural that they would then start to play important ceremonial roles at court. For example, both Cecily and Anne are recorded as having significant roles to play at the christening of their first nephew, Arthur, Prince of Wales. As the senior princess, Cecily carried the baby prince, and she was accompanied at the ceremony by her half-brother, Thomas Grey, 1st Marquess of Dorset, and her paternal cousin, John de la Pole, 1st Earl of Lincoln. Princess Anne carried the baptismal veil, which after the ceremony covered the head of the prince, and she herself was accompanied on the right hand by the Knight Constable, Richard Guilford, and on the left by the Knight Marshal, John Turberville. Princess Anne would perform this same role just two years later at the christening of her eldest niece, Princess Margaret, in 1489. Princess Cecily would also be called upon for another great ceremonial role, when, on the 25th of November 1487, her sister, Queen Elizabeth, was finally crowned Queen at Westminster Abbey. 
Cecily was given the honour of carrying her sister's train at the ceremony in Westminster Abbey, the only of Elizabeth's sisters to be given a role of such significance on the day. This also highlighted her position as the third most senior woman at the ceremony, behind her sister the Queen and her aunt Catherine Woodville, a sister of Elizabeth Woodville who was also the wife of the King's uncle Jasper Tudor, first Duke of Bedford. Another sign of Cecily's prominence is evidenced by the fact that she rode to and from the ceremony with her aunt in a carriage that immediately followed the Queen's. Not long after the coronation, the King finally got around to the business of concluding a second marriage for Princess Cecily. Indeed, it may have been at the coronation that the Princess met her prospective bridegroom for the first time. John Wells, first Viscount Wells, was heir to the ancient Wells family and a younger half-brother of the King's mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, and as such was a prominent and devoted member of the Tudor faction. Although John himself and his family were supporters of the House of Lancaster, he was canny enough to be able to win the favour of Edward IV at the end of his life, and was among the people who guarded the body of the late King at night. During the reign of Richard III, John was in opposition to the King. He had participated in the failed Buckingham Rebellion and fled to Brittany, where Henry Tudor was in hiding. And it was this, thanks to his service and familial connections, that John found himself high in favour with Henry VII. There is no record of the time and circumstances of the marriage between Cecily and John Wells, who was older than the princess by about 20 years, but it happened sometime before December 1487. After the New Year's celebrations at the beginning of 1488, traces of Princess Cecily are lost for some time. In all likelihood, she retired from the court and stayed in one of her husband's estates. Despite the large difference in their age, the marriage was successful and two daughters were born, Elizabeth, named after the Queen, and Anne, after Cecily's younger sister. Cecily was engaged in the upbringing and education of her daughters, and so she stayed back at home when her husband left for the court to fulfil his duties to the King. Of Cecily's two younger sisters, Catherine and Bridget, Catherine was the next marriage that the King would begin to negotiate. Around the same time as Queen Elizabeth was crowned, a preliminary agreement was concluded on the marriage of Catherine with the second son of King James III of Scotland, James, Duke of Ross, who at just three years older than the princess was a good match. Following the death of the Scottish King, however, all marriage negotiations with England were halted and eventually melted away into nothing. For the time being, Catherine would remain unmarried, which given her relative youth at this time was not a major issue. Thus, it was Princess Anne who remained the only age-appropriate Yorkist princess unmarried. As I referenced earlier, she had begun to take on some ceremonial duties on behalf of her sister. For example, in 1488, on St George's Day, Anne, among 20 other ladies, was present in the retinue of the Queen, dressed in a robe of scarlet velvet and sat on a snow-white palfrey, whose saddle was draped in a golden cloth embroidered with the white rose, the symbol of the House of York. The next time that the princess is mentioned in the sources is in connection with the death of her mother, which came in June of 1492. According to the records, Princess Anne sat at the bedside of the dying Elizabeth Woodville, who had retired to Bermondsey Abbey, where the Dowager Queen would spend the last five years of her life. Princess Anne led the mourners at her mother's funeral instead of Queen Elizabeth, who was expecting the birth of her fourth child, and therefore delegated her powers and responsibilities to her younger sister. Anne and her younger sisters Catherine and Bridget departed with the Dowager Queen's body by river to Windsor Castle, where on the 13th of June Elizabeth Woodville was buried next to her beloved second husband Edward IV in St George's Chapel. When Princess Anne reached marriageable age, Queen Elizabeth began to look for a suitable groom. The Queen turned her attention to representatives of the English nobility, and first of all, to Thomas Howard, the son and heir of the Earl of Surrey, to whom Richard III had already planned for Anne to marry. The princess had known her future husband since childhood, since his father had served at the court in the private chambers of Edward IV. Queen Elizabeth even took into account the opinion of her sister, and considered that the Howard family were noble enough to qualify for a high marriage, and therefore, on the 4th of February 1495, the wedding of Anne and Thomas Howard was celebrated. The wedding took place in Westminster Abbey, and the marriage celebrations took place thereafter in the Palace of Placentia. Just a few months later, in October 1495, shortly after her 16th birthday, 
Princess Catherine also married. Her groom was the 20-year-old William Courtenay, son and heir of the Earl of Devon, the leading nobleman and landowner in the Devonshire region of the southwest of England, who was also an ardent supporter of King Henry VII. The marriage of Catherine and William was approved by Parliament during the same session as that which had approved the marriage between Princess Anne and Thomas Howard. Queen Elizabeth paid for the wedding clothes for the bride and groom and donated money for the upbringing of the future children of the newlyweds. Given the close favour with which the Courtenays held with the king, the couple would thus spend most of their time at court, with Catherine acting as one of her sister's principal ladies and receiving a salary of £50 per year. Outside the court, Catherine and William preferred to use Tiverton Castle or the ancient Courtenay family home, Colcombe Castle, as their primary residence. The couple had three children, two sons, Henry and Edward, and a daughter, Margaret. The same happy and healthy life of Princess Catherine cannot be said for her elder sister, Princess Anne, who after her wedding left the court and visited very rarely. It is believed that Princess Anne was not particularly robust and would often suffer from both physical and mental abnormalities. Anne's marriage to Thomas Howard was also not a happy one. Thomas, who we know now as one of the biggest dicks in history, had a relationship with Anne's lady-in-waiting, Bess Holland, and all of their children predeceased them. The exact number and names of children born to Anne are unknown, although there is some indication that the couple had four children, of which only one child, a son, Thomas, lived long enough to be christened. Things also took a bad turn in 1498 when Princess Cecily, aged just 30 years old, was widowed, although given the age gap between the two, this is unsurprising. Her husband John fell ill with pleurisy, a disease which was not known about in England at the time and as such did not respond well to conventional treatment. Whilst on his deathbed, Viscount Wells signed a will according to which he left all of his property for life to his wife. He also requested in his will that he be buried where Cecily herself, the king, queen and the king's mother would deem fit. He died on the 9th of February 1498. Cecily organised a magnificent funeral for her husband and made some changes to the traditional burial ceremony. The Viscount's body was delivered to Westminster by land and not by river and the coffin was accompanied by people of the highest ranks that etiquette allowed. These included the Duke of Buckingham and the Earls of Northumberland, Derby, Essex and Devon. Cecily's grief for her husband's death is said to have been considerable and was made worse when her youngest daughter Anne followed her father to the grave. Following the devastation of losing both her husband and daughter, Cecily decided to return to the court to be with her elder sister, with whom the princess had always maintained a very warm relationship. Another notable figure close to Princess Cecily, surprisingly, was Lady Margaret Beaufort, the domineering mother of King Henry VII. Margaret's kinship to Cecily's late husband helped the princess to protect her rights to the property owned by Viscount Wells. The princess observed mourning for three years, after which she began to actively participate in life at court. Both Cecily and her sister, Princess Catherine, attended the wedding of their eldest nephew, Arthur, Prince of Wales, to Catherine of Aragon on the 14th of November, 1401. Witnesses report that Cecily, who had the honour of carrying the bride's train, was dressed in expensive fabrics, sewn in the latest fashion, and looked more like a marriageable girl than a widow. After the wedding, the court departed for the Episcopal Palace, where the main celebrations took place. During the jousting tournament that followed, Princesses Cecily and Catherine were present at the Queen's Gallery, along with the Queen, the newlyweds and other noble ladies. While Cecily remained in favour throughout her life, in her later years, Princess Catherine would endure periods of turbulence, not owing to her own behaviour, but that of her husband. Shortly after participating in the betrothal ceremony of her elder niece, Princess Margaret, to King James IV of Scotland in January 1502, Catherine's husband William Courtenay was arrested and sent to prison on suspicion of participating in the conspiracy of the Yorkist pretender to the throne, Edmund de la Pole. He would spend several years in prison, although no evidence was actually given. Probably the sole reason for Courtenay's arrest was his marriage to a princess of the House of York. William was deprived of property and rights to inherit the titles and possessions of his father, as well as the right to transfer these to his children, and thus on the death of the Earl of Devon, his titles and possessions were to fall into the hands of the crown. 
It was only thanks to the patronage of her sister the Queen that Princess Catherine herself remained at liberty, at court, and received a livelihood. Elizabeth of York ordered the care of the upbringing of Catherine's children and allocated funds for this to take place. She even paid for the needs of Catherine's husband, imprisoned at the Tower of London. In June 1502, the youngest of Catherine's sons, Edward, died, which was a heavy blow for the princess. Her grief was aggravated by the fact that her son's illness came quickly and as such, she did not have the time to get to his bedside before he breathed his last. Since Catherine did not have the funds for the funeral of her son, her sister the Queen once again stepped in and paid for all of the expenses. Of course, everything would change for the remaining York princesses on the 11th of February 1503, when, on her 37th birthday, Queen Elizabeth of York died. Princesses Cecily, Anne and Catherine were all said to be completely devastated at the loss of their eldest sister. But for Cecily and Catherine, there was also the realisation that they had lost a great patroness on whose favour they could always count. As the eldest princess, Cecily should have had a major role in the mourning that followed, but her grief was said to be so great and prolonged that she could not attend the funeral. And although a mourning wardrobe was soon for Princess Cecily, her name does not appear in the list of mourners. Princess Anne did attend the funeral of her sister, but not as an official royal mourner, but as a simple spectator. And so it was Princess Catherine who held the position of leading the mourners, which she started on the second official day of mourning, leading the mourners at her sister's funeral. On the first day, this post was occupied by the main lady-in-waiting of the late Queen, Lady Elizabeth Safford, since Princess Catherine's wardrobe was not ready. Catherine became the only person to attend all three masses for the late Queen. Without the royal security of her sister, and with her husband still inside the Tower of London, Catherine found herself without friends and increasingly short of money. She turned to her father-in-law, the kindly Earl of Devon, for help, which he willingly gave, allocating her an annual allowance of 100 marks for his grandson Henry and 200 marks for his granddaughter Margaret. Sometime after her sister's death, Princess Cecily entered into her third and final marriage. Her chosen spouse was Sir Thomas Kyme of Friskney, a Lincolnshire squire, a match which was described at the time as being the most unequal in status as ever seen in England, which must suggest that it was a love match. Cecily spent the first years of her marriage to Kyme on the Isle of Wight, where their two children, Richard and Margaret, were born. As the offspring of a humble squire, their children, despite their mother being a princess, carried no royal titles or styles, nor did they enjoy any royal favour, lands or positions at court, or in fact any public recognition. Little is known about the last years of Princess Cecily's life, or about the life of her third marriage. She died on the 24th of August 1507 at the age of just 38. The place of her death and her burial remains contested. According to one version, she died on the Isle of Wight and was buried in the local Quar Abbey, whilst another states that she died at Hatfield in Hertfordshire and was buried locally at the Friary of King's Lanley. Short of uncovering her bones at either location, we will likely never know the exact truth. When Henry VII died in April 1509, the lives of both Princess Anne and, more significantly, Princess Catherine changed dramatically. No longer the Yorkist sister-in-laws of the king, they were now the aunts of King Henry VIII, a man who idolised his mother and by virtue of this showed great favour, at this stage at least, to his extended Yorkist family. Henry VIII immediately invited Princess Catherine back to court as an honoured guest. He paid for all of her expenses relating to the move to court and at the same time Catherine received the post of maid of honour to the younger sister of the king, Princess Mary later briefly known as the Queen of France. One of the first state acts of Henry VIII's reign was the forgiveness and return of possessions of Catherine's husband, William Courtenay. The Courtenays were present at all celebrations at court, and both were in such favour with the young king that Catherine became the only godmother of the short-lived heir to the throne, Henry Duke of Cornwall, who was born on the 1st of January 1511, but died seven weeks later. Only two records of the last years of Princess Anne's life around this time have survived. On the 23rd of March 1510, Henry VIII granted her and Thomas Howard with a large property in Stevenheath, and later that year, on the 22nd of November, the king gave Anne and her possible heirs extensive possessions, including the castle and manor of Wingfield and many other properties across Norfolk, 
Suffolk, Lincoln, York and Oxford. The exact date of Anne's death is unknown, although a date of the 23rd of November 1511 is usually put forward. Princess Anne was no longer mentioned in the act of transferring some property to the Howard family, considered in Parliament in February 1512. In addition, the possibility of Thomas Howard's marriage to Lady Elizabeth Stafford was discussed at the same time, all of which tells us that by February 1512, Princess Anne was undoubtedly dead. The princess was originally buried at Thetford Priory. However, after the Reformation, the Duke of Norfolk petitioned the king to keep the priory and turn it into a parish church, since not only Anne, the king's aunt, but also King Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, were buried there. The petition had no effect, and Thomas Howard moved Anne's remains to the church of St Michael the Archangel in Framlingham and ordered a rich tombstone, with the expectation that after death he would rest there, which happened years later, in 1554. Since Anne was a princess by birth, Thomas Howard was buried to the left instead of to her right, as was customary. With her younger sister, Princess Bridget, predeceasing her in 1507, all that remained of the ten children born to Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville was Princess Catherine, who would go on to become something of a living remnant of the past, alongside her cousin Margaret, the daughter of the Duke of Clarence, who Henry VIII bestowed the title of Countess of Salisbury in her own right. On the 9th of May 1511, the title of Earl of Devon was created for Catherine's husband, William Courtenay, and at the same time, the act that prohibited the succession of titles to his children was repealed. The king was very fond of his aunt's eldest son, Henry Courtenay, with the two men described as having grown up together in the nursery. Unfortunately, Catherine's husband did not enjoy his grand new title for very long, for by the time that all the formalities relating to the transfer of the title were completed, William was seriously ill and died on the 9th of June 1511. The king gave special permission for a magnificent funeral at Blackfriars Abbey, The organisation of the funeral was carried out by Princess Catherine, whom her husband in his will had named as his main executor. Left a widow at the age of 31, on the 6th of July 1511, Catherine completed the transfer of her rights to the Earldom of March to the Crown, and in order to ensure a further life free from matrimonial plans, she took a vow of celibacy on the 13th of July in the presence of the Bishop of London, Richard Fitzjames. Being by nature very active, Catherine devoted the rest of her life to putting things in order in her possessions and those of her son, Henry. On the 3rd of February, 1512, she received from the king the right to use all of the possessions of her late spouse in the earldom of Devon. In November, 1512, Parliament approved the transfer of the title and lands of the late William Courtenay to his ten-year-old son, Henry, and over time, Catherine's son joined the circle of those close to the king. She herself also enjoyed the favour of the king and she signed her letters and documents as Princess Catherine, Countess of Devon, daughter, sister and aunt of kings. In addition, she adopted as her personal coat of arms the Royal Coat of Arms of England, combined with the coats of arms of Courtenay and the addition of the arms of the Earls of Ulster and March. After the death of her husband, Catherine was rarely at court, preferring to live at Tiverton or Colcombe Castles. One of the few appearances of the princess at court was the christening of Henry VIII's daughter, Mary, in 1516, in which Catherine was named godmother. A year earlier, Elizabeth Grey, Viscountess Lyle, was placed under her care and became the first wife of Catherine's son, Henry, who was granted several mansions and other benefits. In Tiverton, Catherine was the head of the most powerful family in the area and the owner of a large number of estates. Her estates, managed by a network of employees, brought Catherine an annual income of about £2,750, roughly £1.5 million a year by modern standards. This enabled Princess Catherine to live a grand and opulent life, befitting her birth. She regularly bought luxury items such as spices, French and Rhenish wines and expensive fabrics such as velvet and satin. She was fond of hunting, she listened to minstrels, she kept three jesters, and on the New Year's holidays in 1524, several troops of actors visited Catherine's house, as well as the Epiphany singers from Exeter. In short, she lived a grand existence, safely ensconced away from the court, living almost as the queen of her own mini-court. 
She maintained a close relationship with her children, particularly her son and heir, Henry Courtenay, who the king eventually elevated to be Marquess of Exeter. Catherine was described as a very kind person. She never quarrelled with her neighbours if they happened to shoot game in her possessions, and she did not severely punish the poor if they took goods from her lands. Furthermore, she regularly distributed generous alms. In the spring of 1524, Catherine fell ill. Two doctors were called to her bedside, which may indicate the seriousness of her illness, but, whatever it was, she rallied and would go on to live for another three years. In May 1527, Catherine made her will, perhaps slightly prematurely, for she would go on to live for another six months, dying on the 15th of November 1527 at Tiverton Castle. At the age of about 49 years old, she was the longest lived by over a decade of the many children of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. Her burial took place on the 2nd of December in St Peter's Church in what was described as a magnificent ceremony. On the grave of the princess, by order of her son, a horizontal effigy was installed. During the English Reformation, the chapel in which Catherine was buried was destroyed by Protestants. And so sadly, it is not possible to determine which of the bodies that were eventually uncovered belonged to the last-lived princess of the House of York. Catherine's son and heir, Henry Courtenay, Marcus of Exeter, would eventually lose his life on the executioner's scaffold, alongside his cousin, Henry Pole, Baron Montague. Both men were senior representatives of the House of York, and thus claimants to the throne. They would become caught up in a supposed conspiracy in 1538, known as the Exeter Conspiracy, which looked to place Henry Courtenay on the throne in place of his cousin, Henry VIII. By the time the king was finished, 13 people were executed, of which the most well-known was Margaret Pole, the elderly Countess of Salisbury, a cousin of the York princesses and mother to Henry, Baron Montague. In the modern era, the stories of the Tudor York princesses are all but forgotten. When we hear the phrase, the York princesses, we naturally think of their modern counterparts, the princesses Beatrice and Eugenie. And yet the lives of Cecily, Anne and Catherine and the role that they played in the reigns of Henry VII and Henry VIII make them immovable objects in the wider Tudor story. It should not be forgotten that had there been some impediment to the marriage between Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, that we would very likely have had our first ever Queen Cecily, which alone tells us just how important she and her younger sisters were at the time. I hope this episode will have inspired you, listeners, to go away and delve into the stories of these remarkable women, the daughters of a king who at one time would have been viewed as the very future of the monarchy, but by virtue of defeat on Bosworth Field of their uncle, became relegated to the Tudor sea list, but I hope in time, take on a more starring role. And so that brings me to the end of this week's episode of the Tudor Chess Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, my Patreon-exclusive series, Historian Unwrapped, is back, and I'm inviting none other than the amazing Dr. Owen Emerson onto the channel for a discussion all about his historical opinions. I also release a weekly subscriber podcast episode, which can be accessed via my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the Tudor Chest, or signing up via Apple Podcasts. Thank you again for your support of the Tudor Chest, and speak soon.